This is my jet-powered hovercraft. It uses a real working jet engine and I've built it to be actually drivable. You can climb aboard, power it up and jet off at some bottom clenching speeds. So today you'll see how I converted the electric hovercraft I made last month to jet power while getting to grips with the new controls and learning how to drive it around without dying. Then you'll see how my friend Matt and I put the hovercraft to the test to see just how fast it would go, completely unrestricted, when I gave it 100% throttle on a big open beach. You'll also see some frustration, improvisation, and things not entirely going to plan. Oh no! Oh. Now I know what you're thinking, yes this is the same engine that I used on my RC jet car a few months ago. Yep, it's still working, believe it or not, despite having crashed a couple of times. Now this here is a real working jet engine and it's completely different to this, an electric ducted fan, which I've used a few of on my hovercraft as the lift motors. This on the other hand burns real jet fuel and can push things along very, very quickly indeed. Okay, so great, I can just slap this thing on my hovercraft and it'll be good to go, right? Well, no, and that's because as with most of my engineering challenges, it wouldn't be quite that simple. My previous design of this hovercraft used electric motors with steerable rudders, but now without those I'd have to come up with a whole new steering arrangement to make the most out of this jet engine. But before I could focus on that, I had to fix a few other things with the hovercraft first. The first problem was that my skirt on the hovercraft had seen better days after some, shall we say, thorough testing the last time out. Oh no! It hadn't really enjoyed coming to a grinding halt on the abrasive concrete, so I'd have to do some repairs. It had fully ripped away from the taped joints, so I realised that I'd need to make this stronger so it would be more reliable. Problem number two was, with the winter weather now setting in, I'd need this thing to be much more weather resistant. So I waterproofed the foam board with a spray sealer, link in the description for stuff I've used on this project by the way, and painted the cockpit. And with the addition of some racing stripes, it really started to come together and look pretty clean if I do say so. Now it was time to solve the problem of how I would steer the hovercraft using the jet engine. And yes, this solution would involve quite a lot of 3D printing. I realised instead of pivoting a rudder behind the engine, I could delete the problem and just pivot the entire engine instead, making use of some bearings squeezed into some 3D printed parts that were quickly drawn up on my CAD software. Next, these could be bolted securely to the 3D printed mounts attached to the engine. Now I know what you're going to be thinking here, yes these are plastic, and yes the jet engine does get pretty hot, but don't worry, I'd put this to the test on my jet car and 3D printed parts are totally fine for this application. They just have a tendency to break in a crash. Next I bolted the bearing assembly to some aluminium extrusions and mounted this to the deck of the hovercraft before finally adding a servo. Right, so we've got the engine mounted with its steering servo all installed. I've set up all of the electronics and the fuel tank, fuel pump, all of that stuff. I've added the data terminal onto the dashboard. I'm going to be controlling everything with my RC controller this time. Right, now it's time for the first test. I fired up the engine and decided perhaps it was a good idea to firstly control it from a distinctly third person perspective, that being with me safely not actually on board the hovercraft at this point. Okay, who wants to see some hovercraft drifting? The steering seemed to work really well, so naturally I next climbed aboard and throttled it up. Unfortunately though, the ground wasn't very level and it was difficult to predict where the thing was going to go, as it generally just followed the uneven contours of this car park. As it was going dark, I only had time for one run, but the next day I climbed back into the cockpit and did some more testing over the fresh snow. maneuverable with only the very terrain being an issue. I'm going to try and go a bit faster now but I have a feeling that I'm going to need to find a flatter and more open area to test in if I want to really get up to some high speeds. Right I'm just going to go up and down here as fast as I can. Unfortunately, again this sloping surface caught me out and I started veering towards the parked car. So I decided to cut the lift fans and promptly fell out. 
Clearly, I need to find a better place to test this thing in. Luckily, I have a place in mind. So I set off to find a more suitable test site for the hovercraft to see what it could really do with this jet engine. I decided that a beach would make for an ideal location to test the hovercraft at. This one was super flat, very long, and not very busy, seagulls being the only spectators. First job is fueling the hovercraft up. Then we'll power on the electronics and uh, yeah, fire the beast up. What are the uh, potential risks, would you say? Uh, as you can see, I'm not really wearing any fireproof overalls. So if there's a bit of a fuel spillage and then flames, then <laughs> I might be in trouble. Don't film this bit, Matt. This is only a temporary measure. <laughs> all, all those batteries as well, it's next to. <laughs> fuel, lithium batteries. What could go wrong? The weather was absolutely perfect and conditions were really exactly what we needed. Now all I had to do was climb aboard and hope that no issues with the hovercraft would spoil the fun. So what's wrong with it, James? Uh, not quite sure. It just didn't, didn't seem to be uh, feeding all of the fuel in. For some strange reason, although it had worked flawlessly on a static run just the day before, the jet engine was refusing to start, which was rather confusing. Time to do some problem solving. Yeah. Firstly, I tried changing the battery, which powers the spark plugs inside the engine. Okay. Oh no! But it didn't work. I knew it was too good to be true, Matt. Then we thought it could be a fuel flow issue with the filters, so we tried changing these, but still the engine kept cutting out around 5,000 RPMs below idle speed. Oh! So when it was ramping up, I don't, I don't get it. Finally, we resorted to extreme measures. So explain what we're trying. We think that the reason that the engine's not firing up is potentially to do with the viscosity of the fuel because it's very cold out at the moment. So what we're going to do is just pop boiling, well, almost pretty much boiling water in here and then stand the fuel tank in it. Using the boiling water we brought for our cups of tea and using it to warm up our fuel. For context, it was about minus one degree Celsius on the beach and the fuel had been kept in a very cold van overnight. The most British it's, solution. It's definitely not going to work. <laughs> if it does, yeah, you're right. This will be the best way of solving a problem ever. Basically with tea. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Oh, it's trying. It's better. It's better. We managed to get more revs out of the engine after this, and it looked more and more promising until suddenly. Okay, looks like we got it going. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna go to it. Keep rolling. I wasn't going to waste this opportunity, so I thought I should probably just throw caution to the wind and see what this thing can really do. As I accelerated back down the beach, I realised that I'd left it too late to slow down, and I was fast approaching a large and uneven stream that I didn't really want to cross at full speed. I instinctively cut the throttle, but this would turn out to be a big mistake.
my god! Oh, my, my transmitter's a bit wet. That was uh, quite the spectacular first run. I didn't quite intend for it to go that fast. And then out of nowhere on my return journey, I killed the engine and then for completely forgot that I was, wasn't was supposed to uh, do that because then I had no steering authority and I started rotating. Yeah, I ended up uh, going straight towards the scene of the accident, as Martin Brundle would say. How do I look? A bit wet. I'm gonna get hypothermic. <laughs> oh. Well, that's scary whilst you're actually... That was uh, terrifying. Yeah. Like, especially going out of control. To be honest, it was pretty <laughs> scary from where I was. was <laughs> Ooh. Thankfully, aside from being soaked through, I was completely fine. Remarkably, there wasn't actually much damage, but sadly, my transmitter didn't make it. Well, I'm still alive, just about. That beach was rather ideal for doing that sort of project, so maybe you'd like to see me do more speed-related projects at that location? If you want to help me build some bigger and better projects, and also help yourself get into building things, then make sure to check out my website where you can get a kit of an RC hovercraft that's perfect for beginners getting into RC projects. As you can purchase the plans and the templates and everything on there and find a list of electronics and everything else that you need and through doing that you'll be helping me to get a bigger jet engine <laughs> for the next project. There's also links to articles that I've written in more depth about all of my different projects. There's a link in the description so make sure to go and check out store.projectair.co.uk but also make sure to go and check out this video next as I think you'll enjoy it if you've got to this point of this video and it's probably got something else going horrendously wrong in it.